all of the accessories. It's like the catcher coming into the dugout. And, you know, if you ever played baseball, I was a catcher. You'd come in the dugout, but you didn't bat to like fifth or sixth in the lineup. That, and when you didn't take all your stuff off, you had a rally and you came, you were up before you knew it. If you did take everything off, you, it was three up, three down, you were back out onto the field. So <laughs> allow me to uh, use a baseball metaphor there for the struggle that I have when I walk up here. Um, <clears throat> But it is good, to, and if you heard me rustle over there, it's because I forgot to turn my mic off and I was trying to get my mask situated. Uh, but it is good to uh, have you. I, I, I can't tell you how much it warms a pastor's heart that his congregation doubles. <laughs> and actually, it's even more than that because it, like, it, it like increased tenfold in one week. And then it kind of, you know, stagnated over, you know, and then word must have got out about something. I don't know. that, But uh, it is good to have you. It's good to have you joining us on Facebook and uh, YouTube, and hopefully all of that is working. I haven't gotten any complaints. Being a techie person at my previous church, whenever something would go wrong, this would vibrate. <clears throat> and uh, so I was the first one to hear it. I can't hear why is the picture blurry? I, I don't know. Clean your glasses. But uh, but I, I haven't gotten any of those yet, but I don't know that everybody has my cell phone number quite yet, so that might be that might explain that. But so this is uh, this is the first official Sunday today of Lent, and you would not believe how hard in my head I have been fighting the urge to say Advent. And uh, and I don't know if that's because my mind wants to go backwards. Nope, I'm, we're moving ahead but we are this is the first official sunday of lent and uh, if you were with us wednesday night online uh that was wonderful we were live again on facebook and youtube and and uh it was good to be with you and those of you who came and watched after the fact i know not everybody's available at all times so uh, uh i i pray and hope you were blessed by that time together and uh and I thought that that scripture that we looked at of the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, that just was so fitting for where we're going. And, and as I said, that's, that's typically the first, that's the scripture we would be looking at today. So it's not unusual that that, that Lent starts with that. But, uh, but I thought it was a good reminder for all of us. We, you know, we enter into these seasons where we we put our mind on something and we're going to move toward God and then all the all these things that never distracted us before just start coming at us. And and it's a good reminder to us that it's not in us that we push through those things. We go to Jesus. And He's the one who walks with us and carries us through those things. And today we're going to be looking at a passage in the Gospel of Luke um, that uh, has some parallels in some of the other Gospels, and for reasons that we're not going to get into this morning. Uh, some people think that it's, it's the same story told in multiple places, but really there's details and things about this story that, that really point to the fact that this is a unique story, that, that a similar event just happened multiple times in the life of Jesus. And this is a story of the sinful woman who anoints Jesus' feet in the home of Simon the Pharisee. And uh, where the story we looked at Wednesday night is a story that we have a tendency or a temptation to want to insert ourselves into, uh, this story kind of has the opposite effect because um, we don't want to be Simon who gets his thoughts called out. We don't want to be the woman who's living a, a sinful life. I mean, we want to experience the forgiveness that the woman experiences, but we don't want to, and we know we're not Jesus in this story. And, but maybe it's just one of those things where we, we don't know who we are or where we fit in, in this story. But it's, kind of, it's interesting how, depending on where you are and what you're thinking in your, in your life, uh, how you process the characters in Bible stories. And that's what we're going to focus on this morning. We're going to focus on these three main characters and maybe just three kind of lessons and things that we can take out and and uh, maybe things we need to refocus on or, or get a, a, a fresh perspective on. But we'll be in Luke chapter 7, starting at verse 36. And if you have your Bible or your device, you can, you can go there. And uh, if you are able, I want to ask that we stand this morning 
in honor of the reading of God's Word. Luke chapter 7, beginning at verse 36. Hear the word of the Lord. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, wiping her, weeping. Her te tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other, but neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven, so she has shown much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, Your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, Who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. As I said, I want to focus on these three kind of main characters. There's some peripheral characters that are lingering around in this story, but, um, but I want to focus in on these three, and, and I want to begin with who is really the center of attention in this story, and it's the woman, the immoral woman, the, the sinful woman, depending on what your translation says. And Luke doesn't elaborate on what her sin is, but scholars believe that, uh, like, and this is where what leads some people to believe that this is the same story that's found elsewhere, that this is kind of a, a, a indirect way of him saying that she is a prostitute. And there's all sorts of things that come into why scholars have come to that conclusion, but that, that would really shed a lot of light on the reaction to her, on, on why, why Simon and, and really at the end of the story, the rest of the men around the table, you know it's all men around the table that are saying this about her, that, uh, that she's this sinful, terrible person. And, uh, and so scholars just believe that, that Luke, with being a little gentle to her, doesn't reveal what exactly her sin is. And, and really, the, the, her sin doesn't matter. It's, that's besides the point what specifically her sin is. And it probably strikes all of us as a little odd that she's even in this situation to begin with. But if you, there's a, a, a possibility that this was not necessarily a private dinner that Jesus was invited to. They would likely have attended the synagogue, and it could have been an open invitation kind of thing where they said, okay, we're going to go back and have dinner, but... We, we want to hear more of what Jesus has to say. So in, in houses were kind of open places and, and you could stand outside and listen to conversation. So it's possible that everybody who had been at the synagogue or who was able to came. And, and kind of like, in, when was the last time you heard this word? They had an afterglow. You can tell I grew up in the church of the Nazarene. We had afterglows. And uh, <laughs> and uh, but that that could have been a very similar kind of thing where it, she was not the only one standing there. There would have been other people around, 
And, and it's likely this is not the first time she's heard about Jesus. See, we, we read these stories, and then we forget that the characters in the story, that's not the first time they just show up on the earth. They have things that are going on. And, and just like for many of us, the first time we responded positively to Jesus, it probably was not the first time we heard about Jesus, or, or it wasn't the first time He called to us. So it's likely she's heard Him preach. She's heard Him speak about forgiveness and the kingdom of God. And if it's in Capernaum, which it, it's possible that it is, He's already frequented this area multiple times at this point in His ministry. He's performed miracles. He's, he's preached in the synagogue. So she knows who this Jesus is. She's familiar with with his message, but she also knows her life. She knows her sin. She knows the cycle that she has been caught in. And it's not just that she did sinful acts. The, the way Luke describes her, she was an immoral person. So she was caught in this, this cycle of, of, of a certain type of lifestyle, but she sees and she hears hope in Jesus' words. And not just His words, but His actions. And I imagine she came to Simon's, well it says she brought an alabaster jar of rare, of, of this perfume. She knew why she was going. She knew she had every intention of approaching Jesus she may not have known how all of this was going to play out, but she knew that she wanted to get to him. She knew that she had to, she had to show some sort of gratitude and thankfulness to him. And we can picture the scene. Jesus is, is they didn't sit at the table. They reclined at the table. He's probably leaning on his elbow. And I, I would be okay if we got back to reclining at the table. That sounds nice. But he's probably laying with his feet out and, and she is among the crowd there and she just approaches him and she's just overcome with emotion and the, the tears are welling up and starting to fall down her face. And, and she may not have even intended to do exactly what she did, but as the tears are falling down her face and they're falling on Jesus' feet, he's already told us that Simon didn't offer him anything to wash his feet, so... She's, she lets her hair down, which is a fa the faux pas socially in that culture. And she starts wiping her, his feet with her hair and she's kissing. Are you guys uncomfortable yet? I mean, for those of us who are emotionally illiterate, I have a hard time reading this passage and picturing this taking place. So you can imagine how the people around the table are feeling and what they're thinking. And nobody's saying anything. And I would probably be, if I was going to insert myself as a character, I'm one of the other guys sitting around the table not looking directly at what's happening, but I know exactly what's going on. And I'm thinking to myself, what is this woman doing? And why does Jesus not have the moral sense to do something about this? And why doesn't Simon say something about it? And Simon, it, there's Simon. He's having his own conflict. And Simon's an interesting character in this story because it tells us he's a Pharisee. So we know, at least on some level, what type of person he is. And just like Nicodemus, his curiosity is, is peaked enough, and it might even have been just morbid curiosity to find out more about Jesus. He's heard him preach. He's, he's, he's heard him teach and and he's at least intrigued enough to open his house to him with, along with others to hear maybe just more of what he has to say. We don't get any indication that Simon was trying to trap him in something that he was saying, but it, it could be one of those things where he's noticed something different in Jesus. He knows he's some kind of prophet. He has some sort of possession of the Word of God on some level that, that he can speak with authority and, and he, has, he, he knows what's right and he knows what's holy. He just... He, there appears to be something different about him, but in the middle of all this, now Simon's starting to have his doubts because he thinks to himself, man, if this man were really a prophet, he would know what was going on. He would know who this woman is, and he would know that she is a sinner. Now, I want to cut Simon and the other guys around the table some slack here because unfairly to them, 
there have been accusations without any shred of evidence that the reason they knew who she was was because they had enjoyed her company. That is a gross misunderstanding of the type of men Pharisees were. All of our little good deeds that we do, we wouldn't even come close to the moral purity of a Pharisee. They wouldn't have found they would not have put themselves in a position that would have disqualified them not not only from their authority as a Pharisee, which brings up all sorts of other issues. They wouldn't have they, they don't want to be disqualified from the synagogue or the temple. So at the very least, he he knew who this woman was, probably because people just knew who she was. And the fact that she didn't have the good sense to keep her hair up. Or wear a head covering in the presence of men. So it, it might not have been that there was something deeply outwardly sinful going on in Simon's life and he's just trying to cover himself. Jesus gets a little deeper with the Pharisees than pointing out surface things. He goes, he goes really deep with their issues. And we see that as he addresses those things. But he has these questions that he, it, he just starts thinking, well, maybe he's not who I thought he was. And then there's Jesus. And the first time we hear Jesus speak in this story, he responds to something that's not even spoken out loud, which is kind of creepy. Because he knows exactly what Simon's thinking. There's a, a song I give my I give my tease my wife about. Uh, we were involved with a good news club in Peoria, and there's a line in a song that says, uh, "You don't have to pray aloud to him; he knows your thoughts." And uh, and on some level, for a lot of people, that's comforting. For me, it's kind of creepy that you have to be careful what you're thinking. You don't even have to say it out loud because he knows what you're thinking anyway. And uh, that probably says more about me than it does about Jesus. So that I'm uncomfortable <laughs> with that. Uh, it's just me. Um, but, uh, but he responds to something that Simon doesn't even say. And he says, Simon, uh, I have something to say to you. And uh, Simon, I, you can, I can picture Simon swallowing hard. Because you've had those, you've, and you've had those moments where there are people where you think, no, they don't know what I'm thinking. And they say something to you, and you're like, oh no, they know what I'm thinking. <laughs> I picture Simon having one of these moments, and he, he won't look at Jesus in the eye, and he just goes, yes, teacher, continue. And then Jesus tells a story. Now beware, when Jesus tells stories in the presence of others, somebody is getting set up. And in this case, it's Simon. Directly, and everybody else around the table, kind of probably indirectly. And he tells a story about this money lender who has given money to these two people. 500 pieces of silver to one, which pretty much equated a year and a half worth of wages. And in about 10% of that, 50 pieces to another. And I didn't want to do the math on where that fits in years' wages, but it's 1.8 months, I guess, would be. It's 18 months. Is, yeah. This is why I'm doing this and not engineering. Um, <clears throat> but the, the point of the story, the, the amount is not the important point. The important point is that neither one of them could pay it. Neither one of them had the ability to pay back this debt. And so he, out of his kindness, it doesn't elaborate on anything else in the story about who these people are, but out of, out of his kindness, this moneylender just forgives both of them. And this would have had some contemporary application in the, in the day because there were times, the year of Jubilee, there were times where debts were forgiven. So there would have been something that rang familiar to them in this story the issue here is that the Pharisees usually weren't the ones who needed to have their debts forgiven. Um, but he forgives both of them, and then Jesus, he, he says, now, who do you think is going to be the one who loves the moneylender more? And I can see Simon gritting his teeth. I suppose the one who had the greater debt. And he knew he'd been had. 
He knew he wasn't he wasn't gonna admit to Jesus that he got him, but he knew. He knew that Jesus had made his point. Jesus didn't have to point at Simon and call him a hypocrite. He just he does he did what he just so masterfully did so often. He just told the story and he said, And hey, now you can you don't have to tell me, but you can admit what your place in the story is. And Simon couldn't help in but at least internally say, I know exactly what he's getting at here. And then he turns and he looks at the woman, still talking to Simon, and he says, Simon, do you look at this woman. He's asking him, do you, do you see her? Now, obviously, he physically sees her, but he's, he's like, do you see her? Do you acknowledge that she is a human being here? Do, do you acknowledge her? I came into your house. You didn't even offer me water to wash my feet. You didn't, you didn't greet me with a kiss. You didn't offer me, what. and this would have been even going over and above, you didn't offer me oil to anoint my head from a long journey. And Jesus isn't saying you treated me poorly. He's just, he's just pointing out, you didn't, even get, you didn't give me the common courtesies that visitors have of coming into a home. But this woman who doesn't have anything She's been washing my feet with her tears. She's, she's anointed my feet with this expensive, rare perfume. And then he says that line, you know, he, the, the one who has been forgiven much, loves much. And the one who, and I'm not going to say who this is, but the one who has been forgiven little, loves little. That's kind of the end of the uh, of that exchange with with Simon and Jesus. See, Jesus graciously responds to this woman, and in a sense, he graciously responds to Simon because he really could have called him out on this. But he gently led Simon along, and he he Jesus knows we've got him. He will give us the grace. He'll give us everything we need to make the right decision that we could not have made otherwise, but it ultimately it's still our, it falls on us to respond and, and, and walk in that grace that He gives us. It, it's on Simon now to make a decision what he's going to do with this. But I think there's, there's three things we can take away from this. Three maybe fresh perspectives, three things that, that come out of this story that that... I, I think are important for us to maybe get to refocus on. And the, and the first of these is this. I, I think we need a fresh perspective on the Gospel. This whole story, this whole episode is about the Gospel. Jesus is talking about good news here. How else can a woman like this be considered in the same league or the same story as a man like Simon? Or us. The Gospel. He's talking about grace. Both of them owe. Neither one of them can repay. One of them is painfully aware that she, she owes and does not have the ability to pay. But she's also wonderfully aware of the fact that someone else is offering to forgive that debt. And I, and I know this isn't just me when I read stories like this, but there's something inherently within us that says this is not fair. Um, there's things, there's, and I'm not going to get into the merits of, of some of these decisions that might be lingering in our government, but there's things about certain types of debt forgiveness we think about these, this is just not fair. Two completely different things, but just take that feeling that you think when you hear something like that and put it here. Simon's thinking to himself, this is not fair. I am a Pharisee. I am not the one who has lost all moral sense. I'm the good guy here. And Jesus is offering him good news, grace in the midst of this refusal to acknowledge his place in the story. 
And I think that's why it's so hard for us to pick a spot in the story. We, we don't want to be that guy. We don't want to be the self-righteous Pharisee who just refuses to admit his need, but we also don't want to be this immoral person. Well, I'm, you know, yeah, I need forgiveness, but not that. But Jesus is he's talking about grace here. He's talking about this free offer of reconciliation and redemption. He's talking about what it looks like and what it means to live in this grace. And it begins with an appreciation and an acceptance of two things. The first one is the hardest one to admit. Your state. Why you need this grace and forgiveness in the first place. And we see two different responses here. We see the woman who, like I said, she's painfully aware of what her state is. And then Simon, and we'll throw the other guys in here with him. Simon and the rest of the Pharisees who are around this table, they fit this other response that's, I just, I don't see it. You may, I, you, I'm not perfect, but I just don't see this. And it takes an awareness and an acceptance of who we really are apart from the grace of God before we can appreciate and truly understand what the offer is that's being given to us. We have to walk around like the guy who knows I owe 500 pieces of silver and I don't have any way to pay this back. But I would be a fool not to let somebody, if somebody was offering, I would be a fool. Now you might think there's a catch here, you know, that they're going to want something from me. And yes, there is kind of a catch, but but it, you wouldn't you wouldn't respond to it as as being angry if you were at least aware that you owed this. And so we need to get a we need to get a fresh perspective and a new perspective on what the gospel is. The gospel is not a pick me up, make you feel good about yourself tool. It's not something to boost your self-esteem. In fact, it almost requires you losing all self-esteem, the way we think about self-esteem. And it requires us to, to, to really latch on to this idea and this reality that I can only feel good about myself, I can only have real self-esteem, as my life is connected and in fellowship with this one who has offered this forgiveness to me. So while it's not a self-help, feel-good kind of thing, it does come with that. Because we only begin to be our true selves as we enter into this. See, in, in verse 47, Jesus doesn't pull any punches. He says, this woman, this, it, her sins, and they are many. And you don't see the woman responding by going, did he just say what I think he said? No, she knew. She wasn't going to argue with... She, she knew she couldn't argue with that. Her sins, and they are many. Jesus doesn't paint this flowery picture of her. She's a sinful, immoral person. They've been forgiven. And so, she has loved much. And the Gospel tells us that, that we can only get into that place through this door of forgiveness and the door of the good news of the Gospel. Which brings us to the second thing. We need a fresh experience of gratitude. I, uh, I can be an exceptionally ungrateful person. Um, and not overtly. I won't just like cruelly tell somebody I'm not thankful, more by just not being actively grateful, I guess, would be the way to put it. Um, we need a fresh experience of gratitude, and, and we need to be careful here that we don't read into this, and in, in it's verses 47 and 48, that Jesus is not saying that the woman's love is what produced her forgiveness. It was actually the other way around. It was Jesus' forgiveness and her, His acceptance of her that produced the love and the gratitude. Who She's responding to life, to grace. She's not producing the acceptance. 
when she understands who Jesus was and what he is offering her in spite of what she knows she has done and who she currently is. I love it when, when Scripture points out that, that Jesus loved us and died for us even while we didn't have to. I heard somebody say, uh, when they, they said, well, I've got to stop doing this before I can come to Jesus. And somebody said, well, do you have to, take a, you have to get cleaned up before you take a bath? The point is, number one, he did that before there was anything good and acceptable about any of us, mostly because there, we couldn't do anything good and acceptable. And, and when she realizes this and, and she understands that because of who Jesus is, he is calling her to himself and saying, you don't have to live this way anymore, she can't help but respond in gratitude. And she responds in a way, like I said earlier, it kind of makes people uncomfortable. I probably would never respond to something that way. That's just my personality. It's all, but I might be kneeling and washing feet inside. We'll just put it that way. But it's not, it's not that her love produces the response of Jesus. It's Jesus' response to her that produces the love and the gratitude in him or in her and and we need to get a fresh perspective and a fresh experience of that we need to be reminded of that reality of the gospel and then that will produce if we get a proper perspective on the gospel it should produce that gratitude in us and there's something that well again we go back to this whole thing what's well, just not fair no it's not you're right, it's not fair. If you were to take a scale of justice, you know, as far as how we would, it's not. But it's a good thing, and I'm very thankful that God doesn't measure justice and mercy on the same scale that we do. He doesn't have some lady holding scales. He is. He's the determining factor. And so, yeah, it's probably not going to seem fair to us because we don't see things the way God sees them. I heard somebody say, we don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. And this woman seeing things as she is now sees this Jesus is a one. He, he's the one we've been waiting for. He's more than a prophet. And she can't help but just pour out this emotion and this response of gratitude to him. When was the last time the hope and, and joy of salvation produced gratitude in you? an overwhelming sense of gratitude. It might have been about 20 minutes ago when they were singing. <clears throat> Simon didn't get it. For him, there was no place in the kingdom for a woman like this. And so we see his response is one, <laughs> gratitude is not the word that comes to mind. So we need a fresh experience of, of gratitude. We need a fresh perspective on the gospel and we need a fresh glimpse of Jesus. Because again, that's what the story is all about. It's about Jesus. It all comes back to Jesus. It doesn't matter where you read in this book, whether it's some weird ceremonial law in Leviticus or... Paul writing, as we read last week, about who we are in Christ. It's all about Jesus. It all comes back to Him. And in order to get a good grasp of that, we have to have a fresh glimpse of Him. And maybe, glimpse is probably a poor choice of words. We just need to gaze on Him. It's not about this woman, although she's kind of one of the main characters. It's not about Simon. We only this is the only time we ever hear about this is the only time we ever hear about this woman. We hear about Jesus a lot more often in the rest of Scripture. It's not about them. They're examples in the story. It's about Jesus. You notice back in verse 34, just before this, and it's a segue from the previous episodes in Jesus' life to this, he's accused of being a drunk a drunkard and a glutton. Because he hangs out with drunkards and gluttons, with sinners and tax collectors. So who is this kind of Jesus? He is the kind of Jesus that goes and rescues drunkards and gluttons and prostitutes 
and murderers and sinners and self-righteous Pharisees. Don't think that Jesus wasn't extending the offer of grace to Simon too. The woman had already responded to it. He was saying, see what can happen and this, this can be you, Simon. And this can be all these other guys that are looking over our shoulder wondering what's going on. <laughs> That's the kind of Jesus He is. He's the kind of Jesus that calls each and every one of us to a new kind of life. One that says goodbye to a certain type of lifestyle and says hello and steps into a, a life that is marked by... And if you read the uh, extra readings this week, you will come across this list. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. That's the kind of life that is produced when we step into this life that Jesus calls us to. That's a pretty attractive life. It should, it should be an attractive life. They said He was a friend of sinners. Thank God. Because the other people in this story were no friends of sinners. They might have thought they were, but they were no friends of sin. And we need to get a fresh glimpse of who Jesus is. I think I may have gotten the order wrong on these. I think we probably need to get a fresh glimpse of who Jesus is first, and then we'll get a fresh glimpse of the gospel, and then we'll get a we'll get a, a fresh experience of uh, of gratitude. But you know, the order is not important. <clears throat> But we need those things. We can go about our lives. We can go, I can go about doing what I'm doing up, up here. Easy. Sunday in, Sunday out. We can go about our, our making verbal confessions that we're part of the people of God. That's what Simon did. And still lose sight of every single one of these things. We can lose our perspective on the Gospel. We can lose our sense of gratitude and gratefulness. And we can lose our... our our sense and our picture of who Jesus is. And if you haven't caught on yet after six weeks, this is my sixth Sunday here. If you haven't caught on after six weeks, I'm going to talk a lot about Him. And I'm going to use this to do it, so you get used to that. Um, we need, because that's who it's all about this journey that we're taking for these 40 days is about nothing else than getting us focused, refreshed, renewed, recentered, reperspective, all of those things on Jesus. Because nothing else happens that matters outside of Him. And if you're discouraged this morning, if you're feeling lost, if you, you might be Simon in the story, there's good news because it doesn't have to stay like this. The good news of the story is that what that woman was, an immoral woman, that wasn't the end of her story. The fact that Simon was a self-righteous Pharisee who was leaning on all of his good works to make him acceptable, that didn't have to be the end of his story. And it doesn't have to be the end of ours. In fact, admitting that that's our role in the story is the step to getting to the next chapter. And it comes through getting a, a, a fresh refocusing and a fresh new glimpse on who Jesus is and what that means for every single one of us. And not just us, but but the good news, I've said this, the good news is not just about the fact that Jesus died and you get to go to heaven someday. It's not less than that. But it is so much more. It, it's Because if that's all that happens, and nothing else changes, I don't want to go to heaven looking like this. I don't want to go to heaven feeling like this. I... I limped from the stage, the platform back there to my seat because if I stand in one place for too long right now, my back seizes up. I don't want to go to heaven like that. That's going to be miserable. Jesus is going to make all things new. 
including these little silly things that I complain about every once in a while. And the more serious things that we've been praying about in our church for people in our church family. The story is so much bigger. And I hope over these next few weeks, these coming weeks, we're really going to get a sense of that. And that by the time we get to the resurrection, the resurrection for us is not going to be a shocker. We're going to be expecting it because that's who Jesus is. He's the type. He, he goes and He rescues people. And then He says, all of these things that are defeating you, hold on. I'm going to go take care of them and I will be right back. You could have amen that a lot louder. Amen. Thank you. I'm not too proud to beg for an amen. But that's, that's what this is. That's what, it's about so much more. And Jesus wants to invite each and every one of us. I would, I would venture a guess in this time that we're in, the type of people who would be sitting in this building on a Sunday morning, you're probably already in this story. I might be making an assumption here, but just knowing that you were willing to get up, and in, in, in wear a mask and come in and do stuff and, and do things that none of us like to do so that you could be with these people, you're probably already in the story. So my question is, if you're not the immoral woman, maybe you're Simon. Maybe you need a fresh perspective on what this means for you and the fact that you have been. Maybe you've forgotten that you were, you've been redeemed and brought out of this. I don't know where you are. I don't know where you are watching online right now. But I know that this Jesus that we're talking about, He goes and He rescues prostitutes. And He goes and He calls those of us who are self-righteous out of our self-righteousness into His goodness and grace. I don't have much more to say about that, so I'm going to pray now. Because if I don't, I'm going to keep talking. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the goodness of Jesus. We thank You for His forgiveness. We thank You for, um, we thank you for the breadth and depth and expanse of the Gospel. And, and forgive us when, we've, when we have minimized it to the point where it's just about us and something that's going to happen to us in the future, but that you have in, in your good news, it's about so much more. You've got a whole new plan for your creation through this good news that you have brought through Jesus. And I don't know where each one of us is uh, in our stories, in this story, in in uh, in wherever we are in our lives. I don't know. But may You speak to each of us right now uh, of do we need a fresh glimpse of You? Do we need to get a, a clear picture of who You are? And then a, a fresh understanding, a perspective on what that good news means. And, and when we get that, may it produce in us a, a response of gratitude. Maybe that even makes us uncomfortable how we responded to You. Do that in us. We pray that uh, you would speak to each one of us over these these coming weeks. That uh, that you would you would make clear to us those things that you're calling us to lay down, and those things, and they may be good things, and those things that you're calling us to pick up and take with us and 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 to add into our lives. This isn't just about not doing certain things. It's about taking on and and taking on those things that You would have us pick up. And we pray that You would give us the grace to be able to walk in obedience to You during this time. May we not seek in ourselves the strength and the, 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 the courage and the fortitude to keep going, but may we go to You to look for that and to find that and find our rest in You. Be with us the rest of this week. Be with these people who have joined us in the building, those who are watching online. And, and uh, may You be near them and be gracious to them this week, Lord. And we pray that You would bring us all back together next Sunday to worship You again as a church family. 
We love you and we pray these things in your name. Amen.